Project Everest, Fast Correct and Secure Software Deployment Now. So we're going to, uh, Jonathan and I here are going to tell you about um, this joint project between Microsoft Research, uh, INRIA, which is the, the French national lab for, um, for um, uh, information sciences, Carnegie Mellon University, and um, uh, the University of Edinburgh. And uh, what we're, uh, Jonathan and I both work at Microsoft Research. Microsoft Research is a worldwide um, research lab in uh, basic science and, uh, and applied sciences too. We're about a thousand researchers at um, seven and maybe now growing to maybe about nine labs worldwide. Um, I work at the, the lab at uh, Redmond uh, near Seattle. And um, the lab broadly does work in, in, in all areas of computer science, but also beyond computer science and social sciences and economics and uh, also some work in physics and so on. Uh, my own expertise is in programming languages and uh, program verification, and um, I look to apply some of these ideas to reasoning about security properties of programs. And um, uh, Jonathan here is my colleague, and maybe he wants to say a few words about uh, Sure. I'm in the uh, Redmond Lab as well, just like Nick, and my expertise is also in type systems programming languages, and the past, over the past few years I've spent a bunch of time looking at applications of our methodologies. and attempting to uh, verify more secure systems in areas related to cryptography, uh, secure communication protocols, and the like. So it's, it's both our first time at, uh, at ShmooCon. We uh, often uh, give talks at uh, academic computer science venues, uh, and it's been, it's been fun being here at ShmooCon to, to learn a lot from, from you guys. Uh, um, Project Everest, which we're going to tell you about, is a uh, collaboration that's been going on now for maybe um, close to four years, three and a half years, where 25 people spread over uh, uh, several locations uh, in uh, uh, Redmond, in C Cambridge in the UK, Bangalore in India, uh, INRIA in Paris, um, CMU, which is in Pittsburgh, and also our friends at, in Edinburgh, Helsinki, and, and, many, and many open source contributors. We have... Uh, it's a picture of us gathered recently at, uh, um, at Microsoft Research in Cambridge in the UK, uh, where uh, we have, uh, across our team, we have expertise spread across a few areas. There's programming languages, program verification, cryptography, uh, security, and systems research. So uh, broadly what we're trying to do, so here's a, a, a snapshot from our, from our webpage, projecteverest.github.io. All the work we do is open source, and you can learn more about us from that web page. And broadly, what I wanted to highlight is that you know what we're after is is here. Project Everest aims to build and deploy a verified HTTPS stack. So why why would we want to do that? So as you all know, the HTTPS ecosystem is is a critical piece of infra internet infrastructure. It's maybe the most widely deployed security protocol out there, and. Um, from a couple of years ago, uh, it, uh, around 73% of internet traffic is over HTTPS, and this is growing and growing fast. And uh, you probably, we all know it as um, the, uh, its interface, to in, a, our interface to HTTPS is often through the web, but it's also used for cloud and email and voice over IP and 802.1. Uh, uh, it's, it's pretty much everywhere. Now, uh, the trouble is this ecosystem is quite complex. Um, uh, it con consists of a, a wide variety of uh, interacting protocols and standards. Uh, so HTTPS at the top is broadly TLS over, um, over HTTP. So TLS is the main protocol in it. But within TLS, there's, there's a lot of interacting uh, sub-protocols. There's the, the PKI uh, uh, system using uh, certificate X509 certificates and their own message format, ASN1. There's a number of crypto algorithms underneath it. There are new protocols emerging in the space like QUIC, and beneath it all is low-level code that's doing things like parsing and formatting network messages. And uh, all this complexity uh, leads to problems. Um, of course, H HTTPS is still way better than uh, using no protection at all and just using HTTP, but there's been a long history of uh, attacks and fixes in this, in this ecosystem. 20 years of 
of bugs and vulnerabilities across the stack, ranging from implementation flaws to design errors and crypto attacks. Um, and these flaws have affected pretty much every implementation out there. Uh, OpenSSL is, of course, the, the most widely uh, used implementation of this and has been uh, subject to some uh, attacks. But so has S channel, say Microsoft's one, or NSS, and uh, pretty much all of them uh, have been vulnerable. Um, and here briefly is uh, uh, a, a timeline of some high profile attacks on TLS. And it's across the stack, like I mentioned earlier. It's implementation bugs, protocol weaknesses, crypto failures. So, so what can we do about all of this? <coughs> well, there's a, there's a number of things one could try. Um, in, in sort of increasing order of, uh, of sort of depth of defense, um, one could start by looking at uh, um, identifying specific coding errors and, and uh, discovering and defending against them. So a recent uh, uh, flaw, which may, some of you may, may remember, is the go-to-fail bug. Um, and uh, this is a, uh, if you can see here, it's, it's there, there's two go-tos that are uh, next to each other, and uh, one of them is, is indented to suggest that it's protected by a, a certain control flow guard when of course it isn't, and uh, this led to um, uh, uh, this led to basically a, a compromise. And um, if you had, since this attack, GCC has added compiler warnings to help you uh, detect these kinds of uh, uh, simple errors, and you should use them and turn on all your warnings and uh, make sure that you don't have uh, uh, silly coding errors like this. Uh, sort of, compiler warnings will only get you so far, so you can kind of ratchet it up a bit further, and uh, there's many static analysis frameworks out there. Uh, maybe your uh, organization uses some of these that I have here. I just picked a few uh, popular ones that I've uh, noticed recently. Uh, there's many, many others. Um, and uh, popular crypto implementations do make use of this. So here is a scan of NSS, Mozilla's implementation of uh, uh, Mozilla's crypto library that uh, does a scan using Coverity. And uh, co these kinds of static analysis scans identify bugs, and uh, they have false positives too. Uh, but if a scan succeeds, you don't have a guarantee that your code is free of bugs. It's just that the scan didn't find any bugs. But still, it's useful. You should use your static analysis tools. And you can kind of go one step further and say, well, if I build a model of what my protocol is trying to do, say I have a, a state machine model of, of the TLS state machine, I can try to systematically test against this model. And there are state machine fuzzing tools. So there's one called Flex TLS that's been used to find attacks on TLS before by uh, exploring the state machine uh, systematically and coming up with uh, a large number of protocol traces and uh, finding that, well, the, your implementation doesn't react properly on certain traces. It's a systematic way to do um, uh, fuzzing, but at the level of a state machine. And this is great. You should use these kinds of tools too. But again, uh, the state, even for small state machines, the number of paths through these state machines for uh, protocols can be quite large, and uh, exhaustively enumerating all of them is infeasible. Uh, so uh, these fuzzing tools, at some point, you stop running them, and you, you, found, you find some shallow bugs. But beyond a certain point, you don't get any guarantees that your code does not contain bugs. So um, recently, there's been some work out of uh, in, at in, at Amazon, and using uh, in collaboration with a, another company called Galois uh, in the Portland area, that uh, has been looking at uh, applying more principled methods at trying to prove that state machine code in implementations of TLS are free of certain classes of bugs. So the S2N implementation at, at Amazon is a compact, implementa compact implementation of TLS up to TLS 1.2, implemented in C, I think at last count. Uh, I, they, they claim their implementation is, is around 6,000 lines of C code, so it's a really compact implementation. And they have a formal specification of their state machine in a higher level logical language. And they have tools that check that the state machine, the low level one implemented in C, complies with the high level specification. And this is a mathematical proof that ensures that, um, for instance, you get, a, you get a proof that any bug that you can exhibit on the low-level state machine, you could also exhibit on the high-level state machine. So you can do your reasoning about the high-level state machine and forget about the low-level one. 
Okay, so this is great progress and, um, uh, and it's connecting reasoning about C code against reasoning about uh, high level mathematical specs. But it still uses S2N for instance still uses OpenSSL for, for its crypto providing and you can configure it to use other crypto providers like uh, LibreSSL or BoringSSL but um, ultimately you're still relying on a large amount of unverified code inside your code base. And oh, S2N despite all this progress still does not give you an overall end-to-end -end guarantee of security. It, they, you don't get a cryptographic guarantee that uh, S2N negotiating with another trusted S2N implementation actually gives you a secure channel. So that's where we come in. So uh, Project Everest, we're trying to apply um, these ideas about proving properties about programs at, at depth and give you mathematical guarantees that our code um, satis satisfies high level specifications of security and correctness. And we have a machine checked proof that our code does not deviate from this mathematical spec. And we do this for the entire communication stack, starting from the low level assembly implementations of crypto primitives and going all the way up to the state machine and the high level communication uh, uh, prim uh, APIs, a, a socket like, secure socket like API that we provide at the top. And the way we do it is we develop all our code in this, in this new programming language that we've been designing called FSTAR. It's a software verification tool chain and a methodology that allows you to write code and proofs about the code and specifications about the code all in a single system and have it be checked together. Uh, we do this at scale. Um, maybe some of you have heard about this kind of program verification technology before in your, um, you know, in a, in a, um, in a grad class or something like this. But typically, this, this kind of research has been going on for uh, 40 years, maybe more, and it's typically been applied to uh, relatively small pieces of code, but what we're here to tell you about is that this kind of technology in 2020 has reached a scale where you can start to apply this to real deployable security critical pieces of you know internet infrastructure. So we have 600,000 lines of verified code and proof that we maintain every day under our continuous integration system. It's all open source and um, if you're curious to learn about it, do get in touch with us course of the rest of the presentation, I'm going to kind of give you a flavor of what it means to do these kinds of proofs and what kinds of, uh, uh, what kind of guarantees you get out of components that have been developed in this way. So uh, what kind of components do we have? So we have uh, all our components, although developed in FSTAR, all our components are either in C or assembly. So you, sh you can deploy it inside your existing infrastructure without having to depend on our exotic tool chain. Um, so for instance, we have a library called Veil Crypto that provides assembly implementations of low-level cri crypto primitives. We have um, portable implementations of other crypto primitives in a library that we call HackleStar that uh, provides C implementations of crypto. We package all this into a crypto provider called Evercrypt that Jonathan's gonna tell you a lot more about uh, that's um, also doing features like CPU ID detection to find the best implementations of crypto available for your platform and to make use of it. We have libraries to do verified data processing and data marshalling, a library called Everparse. Uh, we have TLS record layer protections. We have implementations of Quick, And uh, we're in the process of providing a full <coughs> implementation of the TLS 1.3 standard. And so, so what do we prove? We have all these components, so what do we prove? As a baseline for all our components, we prove safety, which means that the code is memory safe and type safe. So for instance, this prevents certain kinds of errors like um, buffer overruns and dangling pointers and so on. Um, and, and then we prove functional correctness, which says that our fast, low-level optimized implementations compute the same functions as high-level reference specifications and mathematical specifications of the functionality. And we take those two things as baselines. For all our components, we prove these two properties. And then, depending on the component, we prove component-specific properties. So for instance, um, uh, we prove, uh, for, for code that's manipulating secret keys, we prove uh, uh, secrecy properties that's, that say, for instance, the execution time of the, of, the, of the particular algorithm that we're implementing does not depend on the value of the secret key. So things like constant time guarantees for our code. At the high level of the protocol, we prove um, uh, cryptographic security that, that says things like, uh, depending on the hardness of certain cryptographic assumptions, 
for instance, uh, many of these constructions are based on, let's say, uh, hard mathematical problems, like the difficulty of computing discrete logs. So if you um, are based, conditioned on such a mathematical assumption about the crypto, we prove that uh, if you negotiate a good cipher suite using our, uh, our implementation of TLS, then you get a secure channel between the endpoints except for some probability that depends on a security parameter. The kind of proofs that a cryptographer would do on paper, we do those proofs about the C code that you see in assembly code that you run. Um, so despite all this, you, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're at ShmooCon, we, we also like to, br to break stuff. Um, is our code perfectly secure? Uh, well, it depends on various modeling assumptions. So, so for instance, as I just mentioned earlier, um, uh, the, the main theorems that we get depend on cryptographic hardness assumptions. So if somebody finds a, a new algorithm, perhaps on a quantum machine to compute discrete logs efficiently, no, no, uh, yeah, this may be possible, then you, may, then you will break our crypto. And that's just the way cryptography works. Um, uh, it also depends on the security of our deployments. If you take all our verified code and deploy it in the middle in a pile of other unverified code, you can compromise the entire machine by using a, a vulnerability in, within the deployment outside of our code. Um, there's trust in our tool chain. There's, you may find a bug in the C compiler that you use to compile our code. Uh, uh, there's, there's, uh, it depends on trust assumptions about the hardware. So um, I don't want to make claims of perfect security about any software deployment, but uh, in a way what we do is sort of like the blame game. We provide you with a, a set of software components that have been verified against these models, and so long as the, the environment in which you deploy our code meets those assumptions, we have mathematical proofs that you will not find a flaw in our code. Okay. Um, so we have We've been building these components, and as I said at the title of the talk, it's also about deploying these components. So we have verified open source components deployed in many places. So just a couple of days ago, some of our code got pulled into the Linux kernel tree, um, uh, implementing uh, as part of the, the WireGuard uh, VPN, um, providing crypto primitives uh, inside Linux that are now verified. Firefox has been running our verified code for, for a couple of years now. Um, Windows, uh, the implementation of uh, there's, a, there's a implementation of the Quick protocol in Windows that uses our our crypto stack. Uh, Microsoft Azure uses uh, our verified implementations of Merkle trees in providing a blockchain. Uh, so this code is is real. It's out there. It's working. Um, and the components, like I said, are open source. So um, if you're interested in finding a way to deploy it yourselves, uh, that's that's something that we'd be happy to talk to you about. So how does F-Star work? So I mentioned we, our, our tool chain is based on this new programming language called F-Star. And the idea with F-Star is that you write code, and together with the code, you write proofs about the correctness of the code. So let's say you're trying to, uh, you're trying to implement um, multiplication by nine. So just a, a, a toy example to give you a, a sense of how this works. Let's say you're trying to multiply a 32-bit integer by nine. Well, one way you can do it is to shift right shift uh, left by three and then do an addition. And you can write this in f-star and then you can ask f-star to, to check that the, that the result returned by this, com this computation is really nine times the argument a. And if you ask f-star to check this, it's going to actually complain saying no, this is not true because um, this may overflow. So you'll be forced to add at this point, and it will do this by asking a theorem prover. We have a theorem prover called Z3 that we ask these questions about, and, and the theorem prover will analyze this code mathematically and say, no, this is not true because of the, of the overflow. And what you can then do is to say, in a context where you run this code, this is the requires clause here, in a, in a situation where nine times A is less than max U in 32, then, um, no overflow will happen, and this shift left by three plus a, and an addition will indeed give, compute multiplication by nine. Okay, and once you do this, you can, having completed the proof, you can ask F-star to compile your code, and it will compile your code to C, and all these, this stuff about requires and ensures and so on, those are just there to help the theorem prover analyze your code. They do not add any runtime checks. So what you get out of the end is straight C code that has no additional overhead aside from doing the shift left, sh the shift left on the addition. Okay, so I'm gonna do a, a, a second demo um, here uh, interactively running at star. I'm gonna try to copy uh, bytes from one buffer, do a mem copy from one buffer to another.
okay? So let's say I'm trying to copy a byte from a source buffer to a destination buffer, just one byte. And I can ask FSR to check if, it, if this copy to desk from source is correct. And it will complain right here saying, no, you can't do this because I don't know that this buffer is not empty, okay? So that, this is gonna ensure that you don't over, overrun the end of a buffer. So um, I can skip past this and then say, okay, well, I'm gonna do the check first. I'm gonna check that the buffer has at least one element in it, in it and if so, then do the copy. And if I do this, uh, if I ask it to check this, it will again complain saying, well, I don't know if at this point the buffer is live. And this is trying to prevent you from doing things like use after free. Um, so I can s then skip past this and say, well, now I'm going to have a clause that says, well, if the, both the source buffer and the destination buffer are currently live, um, and I do my runtime check to make sure that I have at least one element in the buffer, then I can, I can do the, um, a, a read and a write. And this time FSTAR will agree that this is safe. Okay, so I'm running a bit short on time, so I'm gonna skip past this but, uh, and go towards the end, which is finally what I can do is to actually write a piece of code that's going to, um, uh, that's going to co copy every byte from the source buffer to the destination buffer, one at a time, and build a proof at the same time that when this code exists, the source and desk buffers are equal, their contents are equal after this copy, okay? And I can do this proof, uh, and then FSTAR agrees, and, and, and once I've done the proof, I can extract the code to C, and what I get at the end is straight C code. In this case, I get a C code with a while loop in it that uh, is just doing the copy, no runtime overhead. I get fast, idiomatic C code after having done the proof in FSTAR. So we, we have this FSTAR theorem proving framework at, at the core. We build these languages on top of it. We have this language called LOSTAR. The language that I just showed you is, is a, is a domain-specific language embedded in FSTAR that lets you do proofs of C programs in FSTAR. And we have many such frameworks in it. We have, we, have, we have a framework called VAIL that lets you do verified assembly code. And we stack these frameworks on top of each other. So we have a framework called EverParse that lets you build um, verified parsers and formatters in C by stacking it on top of Lowstar. So to give you an idea of how that works, so let me t tell you about Everparse in a few minutes. So uh, parsers, you know, people have been researching parsers since the, you know, since the dawn of computer science in some sense, and uh, uh, they remain a, a significant problem in, um, and in a sense that there's hundreds of parsing bugs still uh, reported and exploited in, in, in real code today. Including, for instance, just, uh, well, Heartbleed, for, in some sense, was a parsing bug. Um, Cloudbleed uh, in Cloudflare, just in 2017, was also a parsing bug. In a sense, a program that misinterprets its input is liable to exhibit any variety of behaviors. So uh, in order to establish a baseline of security, you need to make sure that you validate and interpret your input correctly. And uh, Everparse is a tool that lets you build verified parsers and formatters for uh, low-level data formats in a, um, uh, in, a, in a kind of systematic way. So to give you an example of this, let's say you have some data format of three messages. Let's say my protocol contains an init message, a query message, and a halt message. And these messages are variable length. For instance, the query message may contain a, a suffix of a variable length payload. And if I have an array of these, of these messages and I want to build a parser for them, well, you can try to write this parser by hand in C if you like, but you'll probably get it wrong. Um, and um, so what Everparse lets you do is to, dis is it lets you describe your, um, your grammar in a C-like notation of uh, structs and unions. So here I have a, a type of messages that's a tagged, it's a, it's a tag length, uh, tag union encoding. So I have a tag that describes what kind of message I have. It's a, either an init, a query, or a halt. And depending on the tag, I have, um, here I have my tag, and depending on the tag, I have a, a union type that's gonna say, I either have an init message, or a query message, or a halt message. So you write uh, a specification about, uh, of your message format in a enhanced version of, the, uh, of C data types, structs and unions. And then you push a button and the, and the Everparse tool generates a C code for you that has been proven by FSTAR to correctly 
uh, parse and validate and uh, access fields in this data format that you described. So, uh, so here's the C code that came out of it. It's a, a validator for an array of variable length messages. And the C code that you get out is kind of idiomatic C code that's just in a single pass without doing any copies is going to validate an array of messages. Here you see like there's a, there's a while loop that's incrementing, validating each message at a time. And, uh, uh, and then it returns either success in, in the case it managed to validate the entire array or it provides an error code with an explanation for how, how the validation failed. So um, uh, we do this at scale. So for instance, in TLS, there's about uh, a, the TLS RFC specifies um, in about a thousand lines of code as part of the RFC, the message formats of the, of the TLS protocol. Um, and uh, we take exactly that from the RFC and we pass it to Everparse and it auto generates safe, correct, uh, zero copy parsers and serializers for the TLS message formats, having done all the proofs automatically. So if there's a message from this part of the talk that I want to convey, it's that you should stop writing low level parsers by hand. It's, you're, you're almost certainly going to get it wrong. Uh, and instead, if you can generate your parsers using a um, parser generator that produces verified low level code, um, you're, you're likely to be much better off. Uh, so Everparse produces F star code from which we produce um, uh, with a proof. For instance, the proofs that we have say that if I have a message and I serialize it and I parse it back whatever I, uh, I serialized, then we have a proof that says the thing that you end up with is exactly the thing that you started with. So parsing and serializing are inverses of each other. Uh, and, uh, and what you get out is high performance C code uh, that can actually exceed the performance of handwritten parsers in, in some cases. So for instance, we did this, uh, we used Everparse to generate parsers for the ASN1 payload of uh, PKCS1 signatures in embed TLS. And our automatically generated verified parsers are about four and a half times faster than the unverified handwritten parsers in it, the existing embed TLS. So um, if the security doesn't convince you, then maybe the speed will. Verified code can actually be faster because you can be more aggressive with the kind of optimizations that you do because the verifiers got your back. Um, all right, so I'll stop there and hand over to Jonathan, who's going to tell you more about uh, Evercrypt and other parts of our solution. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, all right, so <clears throat> Nick has told you a little bit about the technology that we use. You've seen a flavor of what FSTAR is and what is the idea behind like software verification. You have seen an application of it, which was the Everparse library that comes with its own description language. And I want to give you a tour of the many more applications uh, that we have developed as part of Project Everest. And the first one that I want to start with is our cryptographic library that Nick talked talked about, which is called Evercrypt. And so the interesting thing is that with Everparse, the idea is that you write the high level description format, you push a button, and then verified C code comes out on the other end. What we are trying to achieve with uh, Evercrypt is a different model. We take on the burden of verifying all of these cryptographic algorithms that you can see uh, here in that part of the tool, uh, tool stack, and you enjoy the resulting software artifact. We distribute and package a set of C and assembly files, and every time you need cryptographic library, whether it is for file encryption or protocol messaging or any of the modern applications that necessitate the use of good cryptography, where our library is here for you. And what I'm going to try to do is convince you that really you want to use that software library. And um, the reason I like this project is, uh, as I oftentimes say, there's every possible kind of bug that you can think of. There's uh, bounds errors, there's memory safety errors, there's also functional correctness errors where someone forgets to propagate a carry. And it is known and has been documented that if you have that kind of errors, the, the security of your entire software stack shatters. So it's really the foundational layer and you really have to get it right. And even the tweet necro library that was supposed to fit in 100 tweets and was supposed to be so simple that there was no space for bugs also managed to get it wrong. So of course OpenSSL uh, has its own share of bugs. And uh, in all fairness, I should say that even the Microsoft library has bugs. So someone might tell me, of course you're looking at extremely fancy algorithms, elliptic curve cryptography, that's ninja stuff. Of course someone is gonna get it wrong. Why don't you look at something more simple, like a hash algorithm that doesn't have any fancy math and that's just a bunch of bit twiddling. And I uh, found 
uh, the other night that interesting article where someone was writing a hash implementation. They had something as simple as a little buffer that would try to accumulate enough bytes so that you could process an entire block of data at a time. And they, the person had tried to be very smart and do some bit shifting and masking to compute the amount of remaining bytes in the small buffer, and they got it wrong. Every time uh, they had between 503 and 511 bytes left in their tiny buffer, they were getting the computation wrong. And so what we're trying to achieve with Evercrypt is to give you code that is great on the inside because it's been verified and you can really trust it 100%. But you also think that our mission does not stop with just you know verifying something and throwing it out there. We're really putting a lot of intention behind our APIs. And this, for instance, is the Evercrypt hash API. And it, we really have tried very hard to make it an entirely foolproof API. So you can see that uh, we have an abstract type of state that uses an abstract C struct that forces you to go through our allocation function so that you cannot abuse any of the internal representation details of the library. The only situation in which you have to think about the exact algorithm that you want is at creation time. The library will figure out what is the correct block size, what is the correct temporary buffer size, and all of the module and block computations will be taken care of for you. Even though most hashes are block-based and require you to fill in exactly the right block amount of data, the library will do buffer management under the hood and will allow you to pass any arbitrary amount of data. And finally, you have to do some padding and encode the length when you want to wrap up and compute the actual hash of the data. And the library will do an internal copy for you to make sure that if you change your mind and decide to give more data into the hash, you won't deal with invalid state. So really the only thing you have to do is do the correct memory management yourself by making sure that you go free only once. And that's really emblematic of what we're trying to achieve with that software library. We want to give you APIs that are pleasant and safe to use. And so that's the reason why we call this library a cryptographic provider, because it should provide for your every needs for cryptography. It's really the foundation of your software stack. It's usable in a variety of contexts. And we have reached a stage where we have enough algorithms that we're pretty much on par with, say, Lipsodium in terms of co code coverage. And the message is really that there's no reason not to use it, because we are matching or sometimes exceeding the performance of existing cryptographic algorithms. Our APIs are what I call agile, and I will describe that uh, in a couple slides. And we have, as Nick mentioned earlier, verified CPU auto detection and automatic picking of the best algorithm for your platform. We have put a ton of work and effort into making it usable with proper distribution, packaging, and generating C code that looks beautiful and that you can audit if that's uh, what you want to do. And we have documentation. So let me go over a little bit of these points and tell you kind of what is the state of the art of verified software and uh, what you can aim for in terms of really good APIs in 2020. So Evercrypt, as I mentioned earlier, is a foundation and we have both verified and unverified clients. Uh, you can use it from C because we generate C APIs, but we also enjoy writing more verified applications on top of that and I will mention these applications a little bit uh, in further detail. As Nick mentioned, the good thing about Evercrypt is that it's a strong abstraction that abstracts for you the fact that there's two libraries under the hood, one that uses assembly code for the really performance critical portions and another one that uses C code, possibly with vectorized instructions through the use of compiler intrinsics. And so the main message, the main point that we're really happy with is that if you look at the fastest OpenSSL code for an algorithm like AESGCM, we are indistinguishable in terms of performance from OpenSSL. We just match that performance. So there's no limitation in the tool chain or in the technology that would prevent us from achieving 100% performance. And that is in contrast with the prior research that has been done in the area. So there really has been a qualitative leap and a quantitative leap in that we've jumped to the level of performance that one is entitled to expect from a modern cryptographic library in 2020. We have e even exhibited a specific version of an Intel processor on one machine where we beat OpenSSL by 1%. Um, and the other key point that I want to highlight is that in 2020, verified software is not just about verifying one algorithm and throwing it out there. We have verified many algorithms for many kinds of uh, cryptographic constructions, and we have related these algorithms together. So we are able to state properties such as whether you use the assembly version of the C version, you will get exactly the same behavior. And you can see that our coverage is pretty extensive. We have the two main flavors of AEAD. We have elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman and elliptic curve signatures. 
both for 25519 and 256, which are two very popular ones. We have a collection of hashes. Hashes are great, they're relatively simple. It's a great warm up for students who want to learn our technology, key derivation, stream ciphers, and message authentication codes. So we are really reaching for a pretty wide gamut of algorithms. In terms of um, scale, looking at this, just the cryptographic library, I think that is slightly outdated, and now we're around 140 thousand lines of verified code that give you roughly 40,000 lines of C code and assembly code together. Um, and this I mentioned before that these have very nice APIs. So now I want to give you a little bit more insight about what our API look, APIs look like in the hope of convincing you that we're serious and that we have the capacity to craft nice APIs. So one main feature of our APIs is what we call agility. It's the idea that you should only think about which algorithm you want to use once. So this is the API that does AED, Authenticated Encryption with Additional Data. You have many algorithms that you might choose that all achieve the same function. And agility means that you have a single API for all of those algorithms that are from the same family and do more or the same thing. This is a really key aspect of a modern cryptographic API for a variety of reasons. One, it reduces programming mistakes. You no longer have to think about the differences in block size or parameter lengths because the API abstracts away those differences for you. In the event that one cryptographic algorithm should be broken, you can very easily, without recompiling, switch at runtime and pass in a different parameter for a different algorithm. It forces you to have a strong degree of abstraction towards your API, and it means that you have written code that will work with any algorithm that uh, is of that family. And of course, we have proofs under the hood that show that really these algorithms are all part of the same family. Another key aspect of our APIs, uh, which I mentioned before, is the multiplexing. And it's the idea that you have one API, but the API might elect to call any of many variants that are optimized for different uh, CPU features, CPU support, or CPU revisions. If you look at poly 1 through a 5, what you see in the header is this one algorithm, but what you see in the code is that we are poking at your CPU to figure out whether it has AVX2 or AVX, and then we have an ordering from most performant algorithm down to less performant algorithm, and we will branch and see if you have AVX2 called the right one. Otherwise, if you have AVX called the AVX version, we have a version that's handwritten x64 assembly, and then o away and not covered by any if or any if def, we have a default pure C version that is portable C. And all of that is built in into our library. You just have to call the init function once. We have proofs of equivalence so that you can uh, sleep in peace and know that no matter which algorithm we run, you will get the exact same behavior. And it's completely transparent for the clients and encourages C clients to not worry about these low level details. So that's really the kind of modern API you are entitled to expect from uh, modern verified code. The neat thing is uh, we also have a nice packaging and one thing that turned out to be very useful is that we have very minimal dependencies. We don't depend on any other libraries. We just have a few headers that define a few standard types. And that means that our library has been popular in some contexts such as IoT, where you really care about cherry picking one single, single algorithm for your project that has minimal dependencies. Of course, if you take the entire library, we would be delighted. But if you need just a hash algorithm for your IoT implementation, then uh, you can just pick four files and you're good to go. And we recently published documentation, so uh, we're not just mad scientists and we're trying to uh, do things right. So now that you've seen a little bit the crypto library, which I would say is our flagship project in terms of maturity and completeness, let me give you, uh, as an opening towards the end of this talk, kind of a panorama of all the many applications that you can build once you have a solid parsing library and a solid cryptographic library. So um, one thing that we've done is that we've been approaching existing libraries such as Embed TLS to see if they would pick one or two of our algorithms. And Embed TLS had known constant time issues with their cryptographic algorithms, so they were very happy to take our curve to 5519. And so that immediately gave us a foot in Open Enclave because Open Enclave uses Embed TLS. And on top of that, on top of the Evercrypt library, one thing we built is an implementation of Merkle trees uh, that not only has been used inside uh, an Azure technology called Confidential Consortium Framework, which is essentially an enterprise blockchain, but the nice thing is it comes with a proof of cryptographic security that says that 
the Merkle tree is as secure as the underlying hash function. So that's typically the kind of application you can build on top of Evercrypt. Another thing you can build is uh, Quick. So uh, Nick briefly mentioned Quick, which is proposed as an alternative to TLS, and it fuses together the TLS and uh, TCP layers, and it's directly built on top of UDP. Quick reuses the TLS handshake and has its own logic for stream multiplexing, packets, retries, and acknowledgments, and windows, and whatnot. And the good thing about Quick is that it's kind of our highest reaching application in the sense that it uses both ever parts for parsing and serializing network packets in the network format of Quick, and it uses Evercrypt for all of its cryptography. And you have uh, properties of interest on both sides, and uh, the properties that you care about for a transport layer for Quick is confidentiality and integrity. This. Uh, is a testament to the fact that our components are reusable. We have crafted strong APIs that are good for C clients and verified clients alike. And the strong abstraction boundaries guarantee that our quick development is good to go. And if at some point someone adds a new AED algorithm, then we just need to refresh our version of Evercrypt and the proofs will still be valid and the code will still be valid, which is really an important property. The performance is not an issue. We have observed that we have no loss of performance over the cryptography and we are currently working on doing the rest of the layer beyond packet encryption and decryption and implementing uh, connection and traffic management. This, another really nice side effect of our work on Quick is that we have found a lot of issues in the underlying ITF drafts. So it's really cool to verify code and it's really great, but what happens most of the time when you go to that level of detail required uh, by the tool by FSTAR, as you saw in that demo, is that Really the high level idea is that when you're doing software verification, you have to think about every single detail. And when you are at that level of detail, you realize that there's a lot of stuff that is either unclear or that is just plain out wrong. And we have had a very productive interaction with both standardization committees from both TLS and Quick. And just to give you an example, in Quick it might be someone specking in the RFC, the packet number recovery routine, not realizing that they may have an underflow in a sub-expression of their computation. And as you saw with the example of multiplication by nine, that's exactly the sort of stuff that you might end up reasoning about. So we have submitted a bunch of fixes and uh, we have members of our team who are very engaged with the quick standardization committee. And one last application uh, that I would like to tell you about a little bit is uh, SignalStar. So we uh, have been compiling our FSTAR code to uh, C and assembly, and that's our standard tool chain. And a new addition that we have uh, brought into our tool chain has been the uh, compilation to WebAssembly. So the way we do it is that we have a built-in compiler to WebAssembly that completely bypasses mscripten. And the reason is our source language, Star, does not, hold, does not have all the possible insanities of C and is a very regular language that does not account for all of the creative things you can do with your C program. So with just an extra 2,000 lines of OCaml code into the compiler from FSTAR to C, we were able to have a built-in backend from FSTAR to WebAssembly that we call auditable because you can read those 2,000 lines and convince yourself that there's no crazy stuff going on. And the reason why we care about that is that we want to bring verified cryptography not only to regular software ecosystems, but also to the web. And we think it's a really important use case. Um, if you're in the context of a web application or a desktop running web application that's built on top of Electron, you might find that the Web Crypto API um, does not easily satisfy all of your needs. That might be because you have a custom scheme that will never be in Web Crypto, or that might be because you're using a modern algorithm that has not been added to Web Crypto, which is fairly slow because of the standardization process. And previously, you were stuck with either on the web using a version through a big compiler and script and that might add, say, some side channel leaks. Or if you were, say, in a node environment, you were stuck with using the OpenSSR crypto through the crypto package of node that has the problems we know. And so uh, we're really hoping to uh, build uh, an alternative to that. And we're now distributing all of the hackle parts of a cryptographic library, the ones that would normally go to C, we are distributing them uh, as well as something. So if you have a crypto application for this, if you have an application that needs cryptography in a web context, then this is something you can use. And as an example of an application of that, we have developed an implementation of Signal, the communication protocol. So what we 
did is that we laid out a specification for all the core actions of the single protocol, such as key derivation, step of ratcheting, encrypting a message, decrypting a message, updating the state of the protocol keys. And we have implemented all of these using our technology, and that means that we can have it compiling to C or compiling to WebAssembly. And in the WebAssembly case, what we did was that we took libsignal JavaScript, we ripped out the cryptography that was compiled from mscripten or handwritten or calling into webcrypto, and we replaced it with our own. And we have a uh, library that is 100% ABI compatible with the existing libsignal JavaScript. So that kind of concludes the tour of all the things you can do and all the things you can expect from modern verified software in 2020. Uh, a lot of people have bought into us. As Nick mentioned, the NSS library in Firefox is taking a bunch of web crypto and is, as we speak, refreshing more and more algorithms. There's uh, bugs on Bugzilla. Linux, uh, Jason Dallenfeld, who's behind WireGuard and also behind the big refresh of the internal crypto of the Linux kernel, uses uh, a lot of our work. The initial pull request has been merged into Linux's tree just a few days ago, and there's already more pull requests coming in from our algorithms. Um, Embed, as I mentioned, is using our stuff. The Tezos blockchain is using it. Windows has an implementation of our quick protocol, and Azure has our blockchain, which in turn brings in a lot of the parts of our software stack. So if there's one message that I want to leave you with, with before taking questions, it's that Verify Software is a reality. We can give you really nice APIs, comprehensive results, big sets of algorithms. Um, several major players have bought into our methodology, and we would love for you to buy into it too. We managed to have five minutes for questions, so I'd love to take any questions. Yes? So the question was, um, are there any publications over all of the math verification that has been going on under the, the hood? Uh, the answer is yes. We have a very extensive record of academic publications. I should state that we do not invent new algorithms. We just take existing descriptions of algorithms and then we write the mathematical proofs that the code is doing the right math. And so we have a series of papers uh, on the Hacklestar library, which are all... You can find that on Google Scholar. To just type Project Everest, and you can go to our website, yeah, Project website Everest. At the bottom, there's links to all our papers, but there's maybe two dozen papers about this stuff. And the question is about whether it's open source, and the answer is absolutely yes. Everything is open source, both the distributed code. If you want to use the crypto, you just get cloned the repository, and that's it. You have everything. And if you want to look at the proofs, everything is open source too. The tools as well are open source and the papers are all available on our web pages and are not behind paywalls. So we're really committed to working in the open and we think that people are never going to trust us if we are not open about our security. Yes? The question was about uh, FIPS validation. Uh, we have found that FIPS validation is a non-goal for us. The process is extremely tedious and uh, we lose the validation whenever we update the code, and that has resulted in constraints that were untenable for libraries such as the Syncrit library in Windows or the NSS library in Firefox. And so far as I understand, uh, Firefox has given up on FIPS just because they wanted to fix their broken crypto. And a lot of the FIPS, as far as I understand it, is guidelines and coding styles and practices, which I think are not very relevant when you are doing software verification in the first place. Yes? The question was about uh, the parser library, whether one was expected to modify the generated C code or not. Uh, for the parser library, as you correctly identify, you modify the input description language, and it's a push button thing and then you have fresh C code that comes out on the other side, and then you can refresh your source tree with the freshly generated C code. For the cryptographic library, it might be a little bit more involved, so that's why it's nice that we have generated C code. If you have a hotfix that is needed in an emergency, you just patch it. 
and then we go fix the original proof or the missing assumption or whatever was causing the bug in the first place and then the refresh library will trick it down but it's not foreign, it's C code so if anything happens whoever consumes our code has the ability to fix it. subjected any of the artifacts that we've built to applied security testing. Um, so uh, Microsoft has a, uh, a fuzzing service that fuzzes data formats across all Microsoft products. Every, every Office product, for instance, is, is fuzzed using a symbolic testing framework that does uh, white box fuzzing for, for, uh, for all these products. Uh, we've applied this to our tools, um, to our generated parsers. These things have run for weeks All right, I'm afraid it's the end and they're shutting off the camera. Let's shut that for us. Cool, so please.